Victor Lustig was born in Ostine, Austria-Hungary, current-day Czechoslovakia, on the 4th of January, 1890. There's a lot of mystery and uncertainty surrounding his early life, but he presumably came from a respectable middle-class family, which stressed the importance of education. For young Victor, this wasn't a problem, as he was exceptionally gifted, but from a young age, he was a source of trouble. When he was 19, he started to get involved in gambling. At that time, he was at university in Paris, but he took a break in his studies in order to pursue his chances at earning fortunes by betting. This path didn't work out for young Victor, but it did cause him to get into fights as he would flirt with many young ladies. On one occasion, a woman's jealous boyfriend attacked him and left him with a scar on the left side of his face. Once he completed his education, he used his street smarts, intelligence, and fluency in several languages to embark on a life of crime. With his talents, he probably could have flourished in any industry, but that wasn't the life that Lustig wanted. To obtain money and property, he perfected various scams throughout his life, which made him a professional conman. Initially, Lustig's cons were committed on ocean liners, sailing between the Atlantic ports of France and New York City, as these were packed with wealthy travellers, so there was great potential. One scheme of his involved posing as a musical producer, who sought investment in a non-existent Broadway production. His convincing nature frequently allowed him to secure the investment. While on ocean liners, he would converse with wealthy businessmen. When they inquired as to how he made his wealth, Lustig would reluctantly reveal his money box. Eventually, he would show said item to a potential buyer in private. The contraction looked like a small chest. It was crafted of mahogany, and inside, it was fitted with a sophisticated-looking printing machine. The machine worked by inserting an authentic $100 bill, and after a few hours of chemical processing, Lustig would extract two authentic $100 bills. Evidently, potential buyers were amazed by the product, and asked why they could obtain one. Reluctantly again, Lustig would consider selling the item for a good price. Typically, there would be a few potential buyers interested in the box. During the days at sea, men would outbid each other, and Lustig would sell it to the highest bidder. By the time the ships arrived at their destination, he usually sold the money box for around $10,000, but sometimes he even managed to get three times that amount. Before selling the box, he would always pack the machine with several hundred dollar bills, and after clearing any last minute suspicions with successful test runs, Lustig would disappear. He used the money box scams throughout a large part of his life as a professional conman. During the First World War, virtually all transatlantic liners were suspended. Because of this, Lustig's cons were no longer possible. In this situation, he decided to operate in the US, in partly for safety reasons, but also due to the opportunities there. Over the years, he gained a reputation amongst various law agencies for the ingenious cons that he smoothly pulled off. One of his cons involved selling bonds for a repossessed property to a bank. From the bank's perspective, it was a straightforward transaction, but Lustig used sleight of hand to escape with both the money and the bonds. In 1925, Lustig travelled back to France. While staying in Paris, he read a newspaper article discussing the problems faced with maintaining the Eiffel Tower. At the time, the city was finding it increasingly expensive to maintain and repaint it. Public opinion was divided about what should be done. Many believed it was an unsightly tower that should be taken down. This gave him inspiration for a new con. Lustig devised a plan that would make him go down as legend among conmen. First, he researched the largest metal scrap dealers in Paris. Then, he sent out letters on fake stationery, claiming to be the deputy director of the Ministère des Postes et Telegraphes, and requested meetings with the scrap metal dealers, which was of high interest. The next step 
involved getting a room at the Hotel de Crillon, one of Paris's most luxurious hotels. It was here that he conducted meetings with the scrap dealers. Lustig successfully convinced the men that the upkeep of the Eiffel Tower was becoming too much for Paris, and that the French government wished to sell it for scrap, and also that he was in charge of selecting the dealer who would receive ownership of the structure. However, he emphasised the huge importance of keeping these meetings secret, because such a deal would be controversial and surely cause public outcry. To further improve on his con, Lustig rented limousines and gave the men tours of the tower. He also paid close attention to the men's body language and what they said. The reasoning behind this was to discover who was the most likely to fall for his scam. It didn't take him too long to find his mark. A man by the name of André Poisson was sure to fall for the con. Lustig noticed his insecurities and his desire to rise up amongst the inner circles of the Parisian business community. Furthermore, Poisson showed the keenest interest in purchasing the monument. Thus, Lustig decided to focus solely on him. A private meeting between the men was arranged, and Lustig convinced Poisson that he was a corrupt official, as his salary wasn't sufficient to give him the life that he wanted. Poisson was certain that this deal would earn him lots of money and improve his reputation, so he agreed to pay a large bribe of 20,000 francs in cash, as well as 50,000 for the ownership of the monument. As soon as Lustig received the money, he fled to Austria. Lustig waited for the story to break in the news and was wary of a possible sketch or description of him. Time passed, but nothing. Lustig suspected that Poisson was too ashamed to inform the French police of what he'd been caught up in and thus kept the con a secret. As the con was never reported on, Lustig believed that he could pull it off again, so he returned to Paris later that same year, to earn some easy cash. The second time around, he also managed to find a mark, but after the sale of the Eiffel Tower, the police were informed, and he was forced to flee to the United States, in order to evade being arrested. While in America, Lustig returned to his reliable money box con. During this time in the States, he used dozens of aliases, and was arrested more than 40 times but he almost always made his escape from jail while awaiting trial. One of his most successful cons around this time occurred when he used the money box and tax receipts to swindle a Texas sheriff and a county tax collector out of more than $100,000. The sheriff was so furious as soon as he discovered that he had been conned, he tracked Lustig all the way to Chicago. Once the sheriff found Lustig, and was ready to take back what was his. Lustig calmly talked his way out of it and told the sheriff that he wasn't operating the machine correctly. To compensate the sheriff, Lustig handed him a large sum of counterfeit money. Unfortunately, the sheriff didn't know that the money was counterfeit and again, Lustig had outwitted him. This would lead to the sheriff's downfall as law enforcement officers arrested him for possessing counterfeit money. With the start of the Great Depression in 1929, Lustig came up with a risky scam aimed towards Al Capone. He knew that if he betrayed the gang leader, he would face certain death, so he needed to gain his trust. The con was more of a mind game, which would hopefully allow him to part with a small amount of cash, depending on Capone's generosity. The scheme involved asking Capone to lend him $50,000 as an investment he needed for a scam. For two months, Lustig didn't touch the money and kept it in a safe. Once the time was up, he returned the money to Capone and told him the deal had fallen through, meaning he had no money to support himself. Capone was surprised by his honesty and the fact that he returned the money despite Lustig's failure. With a bit of persuasion, Capone handed Lustig $5,000, just as he had planned. In 1930, 
Lustig started to work with two men from Nebraska, a pharmacist called William Watts and a chemist, Tom Shaw. Together, the three men conducted a large-scale counterfeiting operation. Watts and Shaw were in charge of manufacturing the counterfeit dollar bills, while Lustig organized the distribution. The operation was a success, and thousands of dollars of counterfeit money started to circulate the US. The operations continued for five years, until federal agents became aware that there was an increasing amount of money entering the US economy. Problems arose for Lustig when his mistress, Billy May, learned that he was also having relations with Shaw's young mistress. In a fit of rage and envy, she decided to get revenge and made an anonymous phone call to the federal authorities. Secret Service agents had been tracking Lustig down for around seven months by now, but they had trouble learning anything about this mysterious man. However, with the information provided by Billy May, they now had a better insight into his appearance and knew that he was staying around New York's Upper West Side. It was only a matter of time until agents found him. On the 10th of May, 1935, Lustig was arrested in New York and charged with counterfeiting. Although he openly admitted the involvement of Watson Shaw, he denied all charges that he was also part of the operation. However, it was his refusal to cooperate or disclose information that led to his undoing. A key that he had in his possession was used by the authorities to open a locker in the Times Square subway station. Inside the locker, they found $51,000 of counterfeit bills and the plates used for printing. Secret Service agents finally had one of the world's greatest imposters wanted throughout Europe as well as in the United States. The day before his trial, Lustig playfully bragged that no prison could hold him. Again, he lived up to that and managed to escape from the Federal House of Detention in New York by first faking illness and then he used a specially made rope to climb out of the building. As he descended the rope, he pretended to be a window washer by casually wiping at the windows. Dozens of passers-by saw him and apparently they thought nothing of it. Lustig was recaptured 27 days later in Pittsburgh and this time he pleaded guilty to the original charges. At his trial, he was sentenced to 15 years in Alcatraz Island for his original charge and an extra five years for his prison escape. On the 9th of March, 1947, Lustig contracted pneumonia and was pronounced dead two days later. Funnily enough, on his death certificate, his occupation was listed as apprentice salesman. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Victor Lustig. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave me a like and a comment below. And if you have any recommendations, send it to my Gmail, which can be found in the description, or drop me a comment, and hopefully I see it. Um, well, that's all from me. I will see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.